Matthew. All right. I guess we're going to get going with our discussion today. Um, Pete, thank you for driving. He's trying to do a million things. As usual, he's doing a million things. He's trying to keep the, the uh, remote people happy. He's probably checking what they're saying. Um, I shaved this morning. They shouldn't complain about that. All sorts of other things. Uh, but in addition, he's going to have to drive me around because I don't have the remote control. So can we start with the satellite movie, Pete? And we can do the visible at this time of day and put it in Atari. Right? So Pete, <laughs> lots of stuff on this map. We can't talk about all of it. Uh, one is this really intense cyclone uh, over the central Atlantic, affecting just about nobody except people in ships. Uh, but it's really pretty impressive. I uh, wish we had time to, to look at it. It's got a cold front. You can't see how this is all connected, but it is. This cold front that goes to the far sort of uh, eastern Caribbean was all the way wrapped up around this thing. So it is the, the, the single event in the Atlantic Basin right now. Really nice. Um, then we've got an evolving disturbance in the central part of North America that has already uh, dropped accumulating hail in counties just to our north. So really interesting. I have a student in class who sent me a movie. She had to shovel hail off of her driveway. And uh, pretty neat. So, And that was nothing happened here all morning. And now it's drizzling, as Andre said correctly. I think we had, uh, I had all these drizzle drops on my sleeve of my jacket when I came in. That's not usually the way, way it looks. Did you see the speed that those storms were moving? Yeah, they were. Ryan and I were looking at the state. Earlier. We were, they were kind of periodic, too. There were like three or four storms in a row. We were wondering if there was maybe some sort of... I think it's a war. Like yeah. ducting or... Oh, is that right? I didn't even think about that. It's a stain. Yeah, yeah, interesting. On top of the surface. They were, yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. You can see the pressure through the water. It's actually the water vapor. Is that right? Oh, well, let's take a look. Warm See, this was the this was the I was looking at. It was like, yeah, because the, two, the base three, of the stable layer is down here in northern Illinois. And so there's this really pretty intense warm front. And these things are propagating right along the top of it, you think? Could be. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. The storm initially and then that triggers the board. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It has to be even. So did you say you yeah, saw some evidence of this in the water? Yeah, we were looking uh, You have a better eye for these things than I may need to go back for Yeah, that was Yeah, right in here. Um, I'm sure there's a couple of... Uh, so what thing are you looking at? Oh, right. This, yeah. this sort of okay, thing. Okay, right here. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blue, yellow, blue, okay. blue, yellow signature. No, uh, sounds like it looks to me like some sort of war. Mm. And then sustained, something erupts on the front end. Who's sustaining that? Yeah, interesting. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's really interesting. Yep. Yeah. No. Very interesting. Probably the same thing happening. Okay, that's cool. That's, that's definitely interesting. And you, well, how would you go about analyzing that? With um, microbiographs in the region or something like that, would that be one of the pieces of evidence you kind of look for? Like see some pressure trace in the score parameter and see if there's some data uh, you know, in studying these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know much about these. And see if the environment is supportive of them. Okay. Yeah. Under the doors. Okay, so that's just one of the initial mesoscale elements that are that's characterizing this developing situation. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about the broad synoptic evolution of this thing um, up to this point and then also some of the current characteristics of it and then take a look at it in the forecast. It's a very interesting storm in the sense that I think that some of the more impactful weather will be delivered as the sea level pressure minimum weakens, which is not uncommon in the central part of the United States. In fact, it's quite common when there's strong westerly flow over the high terrain to our west. That's very often the case. Storms pop up with a certain intensification, or an intensity, I should say, in the high plains, and then they weaken as they move to the east and finally sometimes get caught by something in the upper flow and can regenerate along the coast or offshore. And we often get them in a weakening phase, even though they still deliver fairly impressive, sensible weather. So that's something to pay attention to when we start to look at that storm in some detail. The way we'll do it is we'll look at some upper level logs, we'll look at um, tropical tidbits as a beautiful a way to make quick cross sections. I didn't have time to do this ID on this. It would be worth it to do so. But we'll see a little bit of the upper structure of this thing as we 
go forward with the discussion. So uh, it's quite an interesting storm. So let's take a look at the, um, the radon that comes next. Oh, you know what, Pete? First, how about the water vapor over the central U.S.? And I want the black and white water vapor. I don't want all these fancy super peat colors because... Okay, so you want this one. Yeah, the grayscale. And the reason I like to look at this, number one, I'm, I'm used to it, and I, and I find it easier to see where the dry slots are and various things on the large scale. Uh, maybe we don't have it. <laughs> Seems like a conspiracy to stop this time. <laughs> oh, they awesome. So, um, here's what I mean. I like to see these dark spots. I should because they show up as a yellow in the color or something like that. But they seem easier for me to see. Maybe it's just familiarity. So, here is um, the upper trough axis. Uh, it's stretched out along through western Kansas, the Panhandle of Texas, down over the uh, Gadsden Purchase area here to the southwest. And we'll, we'll take a cross-section eventually right through that trough axis and kind of see what the upper level structure is on that. And you'll be quite impressed with it. And then maybe we'll also, I didn't do this before, but maybe we'll take a look at some of the warm frontal cross-sections too to see what they look like when we get to that. <coughs> but we won't do that now. So here's the broad, the broad um, collection of uh, disturbances, as you can see. Here's the broad upper trough on the western United States. The leading edge of it is our storm right now. And there is, what kind of feature is this? This is a big ridge off the coast, this uh, anticyclonic flow, and there's the center of the disturbance in the central Atlantic, which is filling this. Okay, let's, um, let's go to the radar so we can see what's going on uh, precipitation-wise across the central part of the country with this storm. And here are some of those really quite remarkable convective elements. They remain equally uh, same spacing almost all the way across a distance of some 500 or 600 miles. So that's interesting. Uh, the northern edge of them remains fairly heavily convective as it goes across the lake and into the northern lower peninsula of Michigan. And then there are uh, some other convective elements. Some of these, we'll see when we look at the surface map, are probably falling into, uh, the precipitation from them is falling into air that's below freezing, is my guess. Certainly this band back here in South Dakota, western Nebraska, and northeastern Colorado, that's all snow. There's no question about that. And then this uh, widespread convective uh, type precipitation, some of it getting a little more heavy and linear in Texas by the time this movie's over, is of course in the strong southerly flow that's coming off the western Gulf of Mexico. The dew points here are in the 60s uh, broadly. There's even a couple of 70s along the Texas Gulf Coast. So there's a lot of water vapor being flexed forward, uh, and the warm frontal structure is probably right about there, south of Chicago. Chicago was in the low 30s this morning, or mid 30s, and Champaign was 57. So the boundary was somewhere in here, I think. And so it would be nice to look at a cross-section over that. Presumably, as the day wears on, the southerly flow with a cyclone developing to our west and the frontal structure maintained to our east, this is going to get a little bit more wet uh, for us. Uh, for some of the more elementary type reasons that you get precipitation in these storms, and there'll be embedded mesoscale things of interest as well. This whole convective blob over southern Illinois starts to look a little bit more organized than just the last couple of images there. It's just kind of scattered over southern Missouri and then starts to congeal a little bit over southern and central part of Illinois. So I think there's a lot to come in the southerly flow for this storm. The forecast currently suggests that much of this convective activity stays to our south and then moves to the east. Uh, we'll see that reflected in a variety of different forecast elements. Um, however, the warm frontal precipitation, which is only now getting organized, is probably going to be what gives us our fairly substantial rains that we anticipate for the next day and a half. And then snow to the north, so it'll be an interesting event in our state, uh, from the north to the south of the state. So let's take a look, Pete, um, at the West Coast satellite, and then we can start looking at the storm in some more detail. Quick shout out to Nick, who's uh, joining us from New Zealand at the end of his ship. <laughs> oh, Nick, who? I think, the 2006, 2009 grad. Nick Zakar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, anyways, hi to him. Hi to Margaret. Well, Hello, Nick. Nick. Island. Yeah. 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 What are you doing up so late? Is it late or early? I don't it's know. It's the end of his day. I'm guessing it's probably like midnight when I want He can tell me what time it is. That's great. Anyways, you yeah, want the yeah. West Infrared? Uh, yeah, the West Infrared. So, here we have a nice uh, collection of cyclonic disturbances in the Gulf of Alaska. The, the main one here is probably tied with the coldest air. We'll see when we go to 500 millibars. Here's the popcorn cumulus that seems to suggest that. And they're widely spaced. I'm going to make a guess. I used to do this in Seattle uh, with a better um, accuracy than I do now. But I'm going to make a guess that this area is about minus 35 at 500 millimeters. And then 
there's a stream of tropical moisture indicated by the clouds, but undoubtedly water vapor in the lower troposphere coming all the way from the subtropics here. You can see this white and heading straight up, ingested into the storm. So probably some pretty heavy precipitation in the hilly portions of the coast range in British Columbia and Washington State. Uh, and then the second disturbance is just south of, of uh, Kodiak Island, and that's seemingly a separate swirl. So there's a couple of things in a broad cyclonic trough uh, in the Gulf of Alaska there, that one of them having a fairly substantial impact on the Pacific Northwest. And then off the map, one sees a, another, most likely another plume from the subtropics heading all the way up to the Aleutian chain with shock cloudage, and it makes me wonder if this is the beginning of a development right back there at the end. But uh, the angle is kind of bad, it's hard to see. And we got enough to pay attention to all the content when I did investigate it in any more detail. Okay, so let's take a look now at the uh, 500 millibar map for good Pete. And of course, we'll, yeah, super Pete, it goes without saying. And here is the 12Z analysis from this morning. And um, a lot of interesting stuff on this. Number one, it's very wavy flow. And this is characteristic of the spring. It seems to me, I don't know exactly why and how it gets wavy in one spring versus another, but there are variations in the waviness of the flow from one spring to the next. Steve Cavallo and I have this evolving idea that it really has to do with how many tropopause polar vortices get excavated from the high latitude before they get extinguished by radiation. And um, there might be certain pathways that get them injected into the Pacific jet under certain types of large-scale configurations. I can't tell you that I've looked at this year's configuration to see whether or not it fits that mold or not, but that's an idea we hope to pursue a little bit further with the joint proposal. So we've got some ideas put on the table already on that work some more on it. But broad, broad cyclonic flow over the Hudson Bay, another cyclonic feature we saw already uh, in the Gulf of Alaska that has a couple of embedded circulations within it, one of them South Dakota Kodiak Island and the other one making landfall on the west coast of the U.S. That one hinted at a little bit by the thermal field, in my estimation. The, the strongest feature over the continent, of course, is this sharp upper trough, which has uh, a very sharp curvature maximum over New Mexico, but upstream of it, the flow is fairly straight, and downstream of it, the flow is fairly straight, until one gets into the uh, western Great Lakes region, where you finally have some anisoclonic flow. So on this side of this upper trough, there's a pretty decent um, tendency for there to be substantial upper-level divergence. There's subgeostrophic flow through the trough and some supergeostrophic flow through the ridge. So not surprisingly, right over Kansas and Nebraska, where this thing is beginning to develop, we'll see that reflected in the forecast, as well as in uh, forecasted vertical motions. I have some QG vertical motions that we can look at uh, that are talking a little bit about the development here. So it's a really nice development situation for us. And to the extent that some of the convective activity here increases the heights here, we might be able to maintain this a fairly sharp curvature and in fact enhance the curvature from the migrating upper trough to a more or less stationary and perhaps building ridge and intensify that upper divergence. Uh, although it appears in the forecast that the sea level pressure does not respond uh, by dropping. So there may be some other things we'll see at 500 millibars that make it look, uh, make that whole situation evolve in a different way. But that's one, when I look at this map and I see the radar looks like, I say that's one scenario I can imagine. But it's, um, you know, it's not the same as integrating the equations in motion, of course. But there's a really sharp horizontal temperature contrast through central Arizona. You can even see this 20 degree isotherm bend toward the bundle right here in uh, sort of south central, uh, or west central Arizona. That's probably just due to subsidence in the flow. And some of that subsidence is synoptic scale. Some of it is driven by the, the front and upper levels by itself. So I hope to look at a cross section. Now I've got the right geographical location. I'm gonna go from sort of uh, northern South Dakota through central Arizona to the Baja when we get there. We'll take a look at what that structure looks like. I think it's quite an intense upper PV feature. And we'll see that nicely. And then down shear of it, is where the development's occurring. Not yet as a function of the lower tropopause yet, but that comes in later and probably gives a little bit of a boost to the development uh, before the decay begins. So complicated but interesting story today over the central U.S. Uh, let's take a look at 300 millimoss. Melissa, what's the uh, animal analog here? I'm not oh. seeing either a wolf or like a, like a, I'm just seeing a face with the two lows. There's the two, like, like, like a raccoon. Yeah. I'm seeing like a raccoon. Like awesome or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Oh, I can't not see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For those tuning in, Melissa's our newest PhD. Man. <laughs> this is what we do in our <laughs> So here's how. 
Here's the 300 millibot flow. This looks like uh, the hamburger or that. <laughs> so here's a, this is that 300 millibot, 140 knot jet that's zonal on the eastern part, 155 knot jet zonal on the western part of the continent. And then here's our shock curvature max. Don't be dissuaded by the fact the winds are low. Of course, you've got a lot of hagiosophy going in the opposite direction there. So the geostrophic wind here is probably nearly the equal of the geostrophic wind in these straight flow regions. So, um, so that's what it looks like. I can't tell from this picture which one's subtropical, which one's polar. My guess is these are probably polar jet features, but let's go to 200 to see if if we get any idea. It's like whatever animal that is put on eye black. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. It's <laughs> the fantastic Mr. Fox. 200? Yeah. So the wind speed has decreased in this eastern feature to 121 from that. So that's a polar jet. And this has also gone down from 155 to 130. So these are the tops of a polar jet core that's at 300 millibars. Down here, it's still difficult to tell, um, but one doesn't get any particular encouragement that this feature in this upper trough has a, uh, an obvious polar, a subtropical jet connection. Except this, this thing down here is well south of the trough, uh, the bottom of the trough, the southern extent of the trough. Let's go one step higher. Oh, maybe that won't do us any good. 250, how about? Yeah, I can't really tell. I don't think there's too, there's not a substantial subtropical component to the flow um, and an effect on the flow over North America as it stands right now in 12Z. Doesn't look like to me. Um, okay, let's take a look if we can at uh, 850 millibars, get an idea what the thermal structure looks like as best we can through the muck here. We might want to go to some of our zero hour analyses, but we'll start here anyway. Pretty cold in central Hudson Bay, minus 27 still. It's, there's a lingering pool of cold air here with which we'll have to contend over the weekend and the early part of the week again. We are running 12 degrees below normal for, for April. Today's the 13th. Yeah, it's flat. It's exactly flat. And, um, and then we're going to be cooler than normal for sure the next few days. And I think even into next weekend is what it looks like. So maybe not as much cooler than normal by the middle of late part of next week as it is right now. But we are below normal, and we may be there for um, all the way through the 20th so of April. It's this pushing the spring beef forecast by about 12 days. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So pretty amazing. It's just pretty amazing to get this long into the season without uh, a substantial spring. Now, I don't know what starts to happen to certain kinds of plants. Um, almost all species of, of animal and plant have some reserve to be able to deal with slightly <clears> unusual <throat> conditions. but. I don't know how which ones are the most sensitive. Greg, your plantation up on the hill in Middleton probably has a, a good enough sample. You could tell us some things about apples what and plants plums are and what um, Well, I mean, they're sensitive if, if it's uneven. If it gets cold oh, and then warm okay. and cold, that's what makes them sensitive. Like I, that. I think we've been pretty uniform with cold. So yeah, I right. think there's no problem with this. So they, they're not confused, they're just waiting. There's yeah. a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The ones in my house don't care because it all caught on fire. <laughs> five acres. Of this. Is that right? Unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> Luckily, not my house. So yeah. closer to home, we see um, as best we can from this analysis. There's a pretty strong paraclinic zone at 850 across our state. So we have temperature of 13 of Olean, and then temperatures minus six at, at International Falls, plus seven at Green Bay, one at Minneapolis. So this is a bad analysis, of course. If you did it by pencil and paper, you'd have a better look at it. But that's clearly an indication of the baritonic zone pretty strong across the state of Wisconsin. And then it wraps in strongly on the western side of the storm, too. And we'll see that the cold pool comes back along in the northerly flow here. And part of that's getting colder also by ascent, I think. I think there's probably some reasonably strong front of genetic activity here that's cooling some of the air by ascent. And um, but not that's not the whole reason. And then you would back it southward. So we're going to have this cold, this cold pool tapped slightly on the western side of the storm, so that as the storm moves slowly to the east, and by tomorrow morning, uh, it's uh, or maybe I guess Sunday morning. By the time it's well to our east, we're going to be in that northerly flow with the cold air and light snow, probably accumulating snow overnight Saturday and Sunday, but not very much. But nonetheless, by the 15th of April, seeing snow still is not unprecedented, but unusual. Um, but I, one of the things I like about this is the, the horizontal extent of the baritonic zone tied to this warm frontal structure over us goes all the way to the coast. And so it's kind of uniformly zonally oriented in the northern tier states. Really nice. 
And then the broad opening up of the Gulf of Mexico in the lower troposphere is indicated by this strong southerly flow off of the Gulf of Mexico headed straight to the warm front. So that's why the ingredients, I think, are assembled for a pretty good rain. And one last thing, just a hint of a little bit of a lee side trough, both in the temperature field and a little bit in the geopotential height. And that is, I think, just about coincident with the dry line in central Texas right now. So those things have an orographic connection, sometimes an orographic origin. And I think this one here has is, is certainly got those characteristics. Okay, um, let's take a look at what's going to do next. Oh, let's go to tropical tidbit. We can take a little surface. Oh, yeah, I love the surface map. So here's the surface map with a fairly dense collection of observations. We have moderate rain at Green Bay, light rain in several other stations, including our own here in Madison uh, at, uh, what was this time, Pete? 19Z or something? Uh, 18. 17. 17, so 12 o'clock. Okay, uh, yeah, no ice, you're right. Uh, there's no ice here. There's, there's a light rain in Iowa. There's snow back in western heavy snow at uh, black hills in black hills or moderate snow and then snow all the way down into colorado east of denver and maybe at Denver. and so there's snow in uh, parts of wyoming parts of south dakota parts of nebraska and parts of colorado and then here's a really cool thing some of the temperature contrasts are staggering it's 45 in chicago 45 in where is that rockford mm -hmm. and then almost 70 um just north of well i guess in the you know at the latitude of champagne so 70 degrees to 45 to 37 so it's pretty clear where the boundary is and in addition temperature boundary in addition the wind directions are almost 180 degrees opposite across that boundary broadly speaking from the north from the east northeast but a few of them straight northeast and then everything south of the in the warm air is straight from the south so it's a pretty intense boundary strongly frontogenetic in the lower troposphere and the sea level pressure minimum is evolving. Let's see if we can find where it is. 992 is the lowest I see so far. So that might be at 992 in northern Kansas. So it's trying to get organized right in this region here on the Nebraska. Can I make a point here? Yeah. There's some very interesting stuff going on in Colorado right now. I just noticed this very strong ice alibaric flow that cold air is coming down on the plains east of Denver and missing Denver. So it's, it's more shallow than the height of Denver, which is 5280 feet, right? Yeah. It's one mile high. So if you look at Lyman, it's 31, Denver's 42, and uh, you can see the cold air racing south there, but yeah, yeah. even Pueblo, you know, 43. So this cold air is uh, not deep enough to move up slope into Denver. Yeah. And maybe eventually as it builds in, it's 29 up there in Cheyenne, um, I think as it builds in, a lot of times what you see is it gets deeper and deeper, and then it sloshes back and comes into, say, Fort Collins from the southeast yeah. instead of from the north. And yeah. it'll come into Denver probably from the northeast That's later right. on as it comes up to River Valley. And the extent of that, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and find the Colorado this one. It's in the yeah, very close. Here's Denver, here's Boulder, Colorado Springs, Pueblo. So you're looking at the southeastern part of Colorado, full resolution can go 16. Well, this, <laughs> this, might, be, the body, this yeah. might be the front edge of, of some of that cold dome, right? right there. Yeah. It might be front edge. One place you can kind of see it, maybe, because it seems connected to this change in the complexion from. Of the clouds right there. The, that southward flow looks the, the reflected around the Palmer Divide. That maybe it's starting there. Yeah, I wish you could see through. That's it. probably right because the Palmer Stream Divide is high, so it does get deflected around it. And yeah. It, it kind of works its way up the river valleys, the Arkansas River Valley south of the Palmer Divide and the South Platte Valley to the north. Um, yeah, a lot of times you see it. it's very interesting when you look at it from Fort Collins. Sometimes you can look at this cold air build up. Mm. You can see it on the Cheyenne Ridge because you see the cloudiness. Oh yeah, yeah, it's getting higher and higher, and it doesn't hit you. Mm. And then the sun hits you in the back of the head. And you're looking at it over there, and it comes from the other direction <laughs> because it comes up the river valley. It's a great trick. Yeah, <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, so that's really good. 
and the, and the southern edge of it should still be in Colorado by this right. set of observations because you got 25 knots in southern, you don't have anything in Panhandle, Oklahoma. So it's not gotten there yet. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah, what an interesting uh, observation. 30, I think 25 or 35 knots is the strongest wind. Yeah, the northern wind is still really nice. Fun to be there. I don't know anything about those local effects, but they must be really notable. Okay, um, where are we going to go next? Oh, we're going to go to a tropical. Yeah, let's go to a tropical. And the only reason we'll do this is to just take a look at some of the structures here. Um, actually, Pete, before we see this, can we take a look at, this is a six-hour forecast. So let's take a look at the six-hour forecast of the, on our own page, your production, because they have, that has the vorticity contour. There's no place on tropical where you can see the vorticity, unfortunately. Yeah, right there. So we'll go to six hours and five hundred millibars. Oh, we're just yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's the analysis. Let's go to six, six hours. hours. That's what we So here's a really sharp upper vortex line, right? Um, sometimes these things congeal back into a more isotropic shape, and they tend to be more cyclogenetically potent. In that case, when they're linear, they're just not as potent because all you really get, you know, we can think about it a lot of different ways. The Stokes theorem is one way. A whole string of pearls of positive vorticity structures, all you get is the outside integral. And if it's linear, you get a really small spot where you get PVA uh, by the thermal wind and a small spot where you get NVA by it. So you don't really get a great contribution to development until and unless such a thing congeals into a more circular blob. Uh, but anyway, we're going to cut through this structure, this really intense upper vortex structure. In fact, let's see what it looks like at 12Z. Maybe that'll be a better time to look at it. Oh, uh, 12Z, zero off for you. Yeah, that's when we, maybe we're going to go through here because that's about where we saw the strongest 500 millibar temperature contrast through central Arizona. So let's draw a cross section from tropical. I don't know, somewhere from North Platte, we've got to go back to the right time. Zero, yeah. So we're going to go from like North Platte down to. Right that this. That mouse clicker. Yeah, you got to do control. Oops. Um, I I moved it, so yeah, you did, but you can go back quickly. Here, I'll do it. I, I can't remember how it's like telling somebody to grow a phone down. Control and then drag. Go like this. And then EV submit. Yeah, so that's. You, you know, I mean, this is almost foolproof. And, and uh, you can really look at some really beautiful structures here. So here's the PV and shading. And the 2PVU isotel is the solid black line. So here's the strong upper front that we're imagining was there in the 500 millibar analysis. We're cutting right through it, almost perpendicular to it, which is just what you want to do. And as the isotax, we're at 90, what is this, 100, uh, is it knots? I think it's knots. 100 knots jet core at about 370 or so millibars. And 2PVU isotel goes all the way down to about 700-ish millibars. So this is a really deep penetration of the um, of stratospheric type values of PV, and it's along a fairly nice upper tropospheric frontal zone. So these are these green lines are the isotropes. They're every five degrees. I would choose to do them every three. It would be really, really dramatic, but 310 is the warm edge near the jet core, and the cold edge is 295. So it's 15 degrees Kelvin across that thing. So if you had an airplane and you could fly through this thing at 500 millibars. I can hear Mel Shapiro talking about it. He goes, we're going to be flying, we're going to hit 295 Kelvin, and then we're going to watch what happens when we go through to higher theta. And you're going to be right through that strong upper frontal zone. Um, absolutely beautiful. And then, of course, he'd want to go back up to the turbulent zone near the jet core and see what's going on there. So, uh, but that's a beautiful structure. Now, the thing about it is, when you look at just one line like this, you can't tell. We already know. But you can't tell from just this line whether or not you're cutting through a portion that's the only part of the portion that's linear, and then you've got some balled up shape or something else. We know we've got a linear shape. Let's take a look at six hours in advance of this time. We'll do the same thing. We'll draw another cross section. Oh, you want a different way. Yeah, a different cross section, though. Yeah, so we've got to go back. Here. And then I think we saw our big vortex strip was right in here. So let's go from Boise down to like uh, San Antonio or something. Keep going just to make sure it's perfect. Let's see what that looks like. And then PV. So this is six hours later, and look at that shear. I mean, that's unbelievable. Look at that horizontal shear. That's incredible. 
This is 90 knots, that's 20. So that's an extraordinary shear zone and still a really intense uh, baroclinic zone. And this time it gets down, well, it's still around 600 or so. But now we know that this is a linear feature. So this is a really sharp upper front, but it's not a particularly cyclogenetic environment as it stands uh, because the PV, the vorticity is too strung out in a line. But that is one of the most intense shear zones I think I've seen all season long. That is quite remarkable. Uh, really nice. Okay, now let's. Uh, I'm sorry, this will seem like it's going from one thing to the next, but that's really neat to look at. Let's look at. Uh, if we go back here, Pete, and go to my vertical motion diagnostics. There's some interesting things there. And then if you can put the word new in front of there, then we get another partition that's useful to look at. And I'm going to use the old forecast from Zero Z just because I like to see it build up a little bit. Let's go to 12 hour forecast. This is now 700 millibar vertical motions, quasi dystrophic vertical motions from the uh, GFS analyses are now 12 hour forecast. The, dash, the dotted lines are thickness in the 500 to 900 millibar layer, and then yellow is updraft, blue is downdraft. It's too bad we can't really see the thickness too well here, but I think the subsidence maxima is on the warm side of this upper baroclinic zone. So the large scale vertical motion is contributing to the very subsidence that drives the development of that upper front in this case. And even, you can even see it has the, the general shape of that, uh, that maximum in the vorticity. So there's something interacting there that's, that's quite interesting. And um, we I think we figured out some of the elements of what goes on in that case. But I'm more interested in the updraft because that's where we're going to see the cyclogenesis. So this is almost on the border of Kansas and Colorado. There's a maximum updraft there at 12 hours in the forecast, which is now this morning. Let's go to the 24 hour forecast. And so this is now going to be valid tonight. Yeah, tonight. And we've got our maximum just to the west of Omaha, same contour interval. So the, intense, the updraft intensifies during the day today in association with this development. One thing that's kind of interesting is that the subsidence starts to weaken on the backside. It makes me wonder what's going on with these in the upper wave. And then if we can go to 36 hours, keeping an eye, on, eye, an eye on how much vertical motion there was there. Really intense over Iowa by 12Z tomorrow morning and very um, centrally located sort of concentric set of isotrope, uh, uh, vertical motion isoplasts, and here's the subsidence. Go back to 12 hours, Pete. Now, the couplet of maximum updraft and maximum downdraft has an orientation that goes from northeast to southwest. When you go to the 36 hours, I think I've kept my fingers on top of these things, that orientation is more north-south. So what's interesting to me in this case, in all these cases of cyclogenesis, is that the updraft and downdraft Couplet always start out with the, with the updraft to the west, uh, the downdraft to the west, the updraft to the east, and then they rotate cyclonically around each other. And it's when they get to this north south orientation that development often begins to weaken. And let's see what happens at 48 hours. Yeah, look at how the updraft and downdraft just collapse. So I don't understand it yet, but I know it's very, very typical that that's kind of what happens in these large scale developments. Here's another one that's just getting going. Downdraft to the west, updraft to the east. If we follow this far enough in time, they rotate cyclonically. When they get to be um, meridionally oriented, it's the beginning of the end. Um, I, I have to put that together sometime. I haven't done it yet. But let's go to just one time. Let's go back to 36 hours. Just to remind you what that looked like. That's when we have our maximum updraft from the QG vertical motion over uh, sort of west central Iowa. And the downdraft is maximized over Oklahoma City. Let's um, now, remembering this, let's go back a slide down if you could Pete. First thing we can do is we can look at what part of that vertical motion is forced by a long isentrope Q-vector convergence. This includes the PVA, NDA by the thermal wind and non-frontogenetic deformation. It looks like the broad outline of the total vertical motion field, you might remember looked like this, is captured by this component of the Q-vector uh, convergence. Then let's see what the rest of it is, is the part that is transverse. And we'll do that. And you get some contribution, transverse is related to the frontal uh, diagnostics. Here's cold frontal ascent and cold frontal descent. And then I don't know what is going on for this couplet today yet. There's the warm frontal ascent, you can see. And then something goes on near the cyclone setup that is transverse quasi dystrophic vertical motions. So that makes some contribution, but not the predominant one. Let's, uh, now let's slide down even further. We won't look at this. 
But this is the PVA NVA by the thermal wind. You can invert that to figure out what component of the QG vertical motion comes from that. If you'd like, taking just that piece, you can split the vorticity into shear and curvature vorticity and then recalculate that. So at 36 hours in the forecast, this is the uh, vertical motion that's forced by shear vorticity being affected by the thermal wind. Very little updraft from the shear vorticity affection by the thermal wind in the center of the, the storm. Most of the updraft, though, appears to look like it's forced by that. That's really intriguing. Let's take a look at the, um, now the curvature vorticity contribution. And the curvature vorticity contribution has larger scale and larger magnitude for the updraft region and larger scale but weaker magnitude for the downdraft region. So there's a lot of mysteries in this, in these partitions that I think need to, to be revealed. And I don't think you can do it necessarily on a case-by-case -case kind of basis. It might be better to look at a whole collection of cases over a course of a cold season and see what kind of characteristics uh, you, can, you can pull out of that large ensemble and see what's going to happen. So anyway, um, just a point of interest that there's a lot of detail under the hood on how these vertical motions are forced and how they correspondingly contribute to um, cyclogenesis and secondarily to frontogenesis, which is an interesting problem as well. Let's take a quick look at the forecast now, Pete. Um, one question. Um, yeah. Wait, is it possible that the thinking air from the shear vorticity is related to that crazy shear that we saw in the cross section? I think, they're, I think they are related. Um, when I, I, I kind of applied this vorticity partition to the upper front problem in a paper a couple of years ago, and it was very enlightening to me to see that you know, when what we call, what the sort of Eliasson formulation always points you towards is cold air ejection and cyclonic shear. That is inextricably tied to negative vorticity ejection by the thermal wind in exactly the same location. You just can't divorce them. They're identically the same thing. So shear vorticity ejection by the thermal wind is key in driving the upper front problem. But as you can see, it's not often, it wasn't in this case anyway, and I can tell you from my experience, it's not often the major contribution to the cyclogenesis. So something goes on after the upper front develops to turn the whole environment into a cyclogenetic engine, in some cases, but not in others. And that's, in fact, related to this case. We'll take a look at the forecast now and see what happens. What, uh, hours or pivotal? Or? Uh, hours. I, I don't know how to navigate pivotal as well. I'm less familiar with Plus, uh, we got to think of a name for the two peaks. There, I don't know, ultra peaks or something like that. Yeah. Each of these, yeah, <laughs> each of these in there forever. All right, so uh, let's start with the twelve-hour forecast at the surface. So this will be valid tonight. Um, I already contradict myself. Let's start at zero-hour forecast just to see what the sea level pressure minimum was early today. So at twelve Z, the analysis suggested nine eighty-nine, right on the Kansas-Nebraska act, right on the border there, at nine hundred eighty-nine millimoles. Let's go to the twelve-hour forecast. Thank you. 991. Um, a notable difference. I don't know if it's a significant difference. Precipitation distribution for tonight looks like it's filling in a little bit more along the, the warm frontal part of this storm. Not surprisingly, as we have seen, look at this flow from the Gulf of Mexico just straight up to the warm front. It starts to get intercepted here by ascent associated with the strong convection. We'll see that grow actually, perhaps even at the expense of the precipitation that falls in association with the warm front. So that's always one of the risks. Paul Rober did a study on this. I don't know if he published it yet or if it's still just at a conference proceeding, but he said, are there such things as robber storms? The kind that rob water vapor from um, snow or rain dams in the northern part of the Great Lakes. Uh, the northern part of the central U.S. gets robbed because a lot of vapor gets stuck in these convective elements. And everybody was saying, what do you mean rover storms? They were reading right over the word because his name is Rover. It was weird. So anyway, um, his conclusion was that there is some discernible impact of the presence of these convective squall line type features in stealing water vapor that might otherwise make its way in the higher latitudes. That might be a factor in our storm. Let's go um, 12 hours further ahead to tomorrow morning. So 991, right over about Kansas City is the forecast for tonight. 995 central minimum pressure at about the same location. Storm starts to look quite different. It almost looks as if there's a secondary trying to get itself together right at the inflection point of this precipitation field in the forecast. So there's a couple of things that are interesting. First, the squall line uh, over the southern states has really taken on uh, sort of a menacing uh, look 
very heavy precipitation in just across the river in Mississippi, and then heavy precipitation across the state of Michigan. Probably just left us uh, our heaviest precip maybe is overnight tonight, and to the south heavier uh, in the morning. And then this is all snow back on the western side, so pretty heavy snow in uh, Omaha uh, probably tomorrow morning. But 995, so the sea level pressure is getting weaker. It's filling in. Let's see what happens uh, 12 hours from here. I want to see that satellite picture, though. That'll be a nice looking satellite picture. 1,002. So we started out 991 this morning, or 989, 991, 995, 1,002. So this thing's weakening, consistently weakening, while it's delivering substantial, sensible weather. And now the squall line over the southern states looks even more menacing. Heavy precipitation on the order of one and a half to two inches of rain in a 12 hour accumulation, three hour accumulation. So really intense precipitation. And we still are precipitating up here, but and getting colder by the time we get to Saturday night. Maybe we're just about to change over to snow uh, into the night Saturday night. But this patch of precipitation that hangs back to the west was there at the prior time as well, and uh, is, is there in pretty much the same morphology by zero Z on Sunday. So I think that portends that this will give us notable precipitation on Sunday, and it will probably be in the form of snow. It'll accumulate. It will go from rain most of the day, night tonight into the day tomorrow, maybe some even freezing rain at some point, and then changing over to snow at the end. Let's go one more time, 48 hours. And that's 1,001, so we kind of bottom out around 1,000 or so millibars. And here we're definitely probably, let's we'll say at 8.50 in a minute, we're definitely cold enough to be snowing. And this will be Sunday morning where it's continuing to snow. And the squall line's finally beginning to break up, although not entirely. That is the main precipitation feature associated with this entire complex, as it turns out. Um, and the cyclogenesis part of it is fairly um, short-lived really for today and tomorrow, and then uh, just, I mean, today, through the day today, and then it starts to weaken. So let's take a look at 500 millibars. Our first 850 at just this time, I think we're zeroing in on the, on the change over time. So by this time at 850, our temperature is about minus two, minus three. So I think this is about the time we ought to see a change over sometime um, uh, in the early morning, maybe even an hour or two earlier than this early morning on Sunday. And then where all this cold air is funneling in on the back side of the cyclone in the northerly flow, because remember, it's snowing in all these places. That snow probably fortified by the weak chronogenesis that's going on here. You've got a confluent flow. It's a little bit hard to see if you don't see the arrows, but the isotherms are oriented in a curved line from uh, Omaha all the way back toward about Green Bay, and there's confluent flow on top of them, so on the warm side, the air is being forced to rise. And there's nothing in the larger scale environment that would work against that. So there's going to be some light uh, forcing for asset in saturated but not heavily uh, vapor-laden air. And so we'll get a light bit of snow out of that. And one thing that's encouraging is the cold pool to the north is just about disappeared. There's this little finger over the western part of, of uh, Canada. But the eastern part over Hudson Bay or to the east is finally seemingly divorced from an opportunity to invade over the central state. So I don't know. This might be one of the last times we get this chilly, um, 15th of April. But let's go to 500 and look at 12, 24, 36, just to see what happens to that upper wave. And then well, I think I'll be done. So here's uh, tonight at uh, 6 p.m. We have our even lengthier uh, line of, of strong shear, uh, but not really that much curvature except at the base of the trough. And then the flow is pretty straight. The ridge here did not really get any more intense, as I suggested was a possibility um, at the initial time. And then upstream, there's a decent amount of curvature, and so subsidence on the back side of that is probably a pretty good forecast. Notice here, you start to see vorticity, absolute vorticity values that dip below zero. And that's right where you start to have the squall line develop. And that's not uncommonly the case. It's parallel to the upper baroclinic zone, and the zero or less than zero Absolute vorticity is often a testament to the fact that the boundary layer air is convectively unstably stratified, and so its moist PV is negative. When it gets up to 500 millibars, that's no longer the reason why its moist PV is negative. The only way it can conserve it is to have negative absolute vorticity in some of those upturns. And you see that showing up uh, right along that line. So let's take a look at 24 hours ahead, Pete. And I think we're trying to see if there's an evolution of this linear feature. There really isn't anything changing about it. It's getting more and more elongated. Here's some of that negative absolute vorticity that's 
I think, exactly coincident with where the squall line is. Let's just see if that's true, Pete. I'll keep the pointer right there along that axis. Let's go to the surface forecast in 24 hours. Yeah, pretty darn close anyway. So this updraft tilts back, but it's got that same orientation. Okay, let's go to 36 hours at 500 millibars. And here's why we don't get much cyclogenesis, I guess. Look at how straight this flow is all the way from coastal Texas until you get to the northern part of Lake Michigan. The flow has no curvature in it at all. It has shear, of course. There's a shear vorticity line that itself has weakened, and it's a negative vorticity uh, bubbling up on the other side of that. I think it's partly related to the convection. And so there's just no particularly obvious mechanism to remove mass from the cyclone center, which is sitting over uh, Iowa, Illinois at this time. No particular upper divergence mechanism. And the sea level pressure keeps filling as a consequence of that, even though there's a lot of active weather associated with this thing. Uh, one more time, can we see the surface uh, forecasting up here? I guess I'll stay right there. Yeah, that gets to be a better and better relationship spatially between the convective line as it, as it really starts to get strong in the negative vorticity. And then one last time, we'll go to 48 hours at 500 millibar. And so again, you see pretty straight flow all the way up into northern Ontario. And on the eastern side, there's a little bit of anticyclonic curvature on the southeastern part of the province. But broadly speaking, it's northerly flow. Here's our vortex uh, strip, which is considerably weaker even at this time, 12 hours later. It just gets weaker and weaker. And then here's our upper vorticity, negative vorticity strip, which I bet you is tied to the squall line. Let's see what it looks like. Yeah, just about right on top of you. So that's what we're seeing. The manifestation of this forecast feature is the line of negative absolute vorticity. So, looks like it's going to be a rainy day, a rainy, rainy night. Um, rain maybe mixing with something frozen tomorrow, and then certainly overnight into Sunday morning, changing all the way over I think, to snow. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get, you know, an inch or so of slushy accumulation and Snows on and off in showery activity for a good part of Sunday morning, maybe even early Sunday afternoon. And then it's just going to be cool, well below normal. Normal now is 55 for high and 35 for low or something like that. So we're, we're accumulating negative departure every day. Um, and it doesn't look like that'll stop until about the 20th or so of April. Do you know what the 850 cold form looks like? I don't know what it looks like. Or my, what the, the departures are? I don't know what the departures are either, because I usually stop paying attention by the end of March. Usually you can afford to do that. I calculate it every day. I just don't know what the average is, so I can't really make a comparison. The minus five line, though, is uh, third blue color, somewhere in here. And I just don't know, Jess, whether this is unusually uh, wide extent or not. Looks like it's been pushed forward in the Atlantic. European Western, uh, I mean, uh, British Isles, Western European sector, but that's the only place where it's really had a substantial push forward. We are still, <laughs> minus five is not that far away from us at, at, um, in Wisconsin. I'd be interested to know what the departure is, I don't know. But this cold spring inspired Emma uh, Sinclair and I to, to change a little bit of the boundaries of the analysis we're doing about when does the winter end based on that criteria. We, I said, Originally, we thought end of March is good enough, but it's not. You've got to go all the way to the end of April. And much of April is wasted, of course, in your analysis, but it doesn't make any difference. There's going to be some days in April that qualify as cold streaks by the definition we have, which I wouldn't have even been alerted to except for this weird April that we've had so far. Question from Lee on the broadcast. He's driving back from Milwaukee Saturday night wondering about freezing rain, accumulation, any issues with ice Saturday uh, evening? It's possible. It's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to be a particularly ice-free weekend, and uh, I don't know when exactly the changeover will occur. I, I think we'll have some freezing rain here during the day, late day on Saturday, here in Madison. So I suppose it's probably possible in Milwaukee, too. I don't think the lake does any good for you at this time of year. So I'd say there's some chance. The road, I don't know how long the road would be. One day over 60, like we had yesterday, maybe re-energizes the ground a little bit, but probably not enough to make a difference when it's been rained on for a day. The first part of the weekend. I should point out that as you get to the north of Madison, the snow gets pretty heavy. Green Day, oh, yeah. you have over two feet. Oh, yeah, right. It's, that's right. Yeah, um, it's going to snow a lot. Of and, and Madison's on the southern edge of it, but Madison's in a, a place on Sunday where the accumulations could approach 
six to ten inches if it just shifts wow. a little bit from what it is right now. I think you're right. It'll be around an inch yeah. or two, but we're right on the edge, and it shifts from one forecast to the other a little bit. So amazing, and it's it's pretty consistent over the past 48 hours on all the forecasts. So it's probably going to happen. Do we ever have leaf out by mid-April? No. No. Well, no, we do. We did a couple of years ago. Was that the really warm March? Four or March five they years ago. Because the oak leaves uh, lost their leaves, then they had to regrow them. I remember we had the cherry blossoms the same time that he did in Washington that year. In Washington this year, we were blossoming. We were starting to leaf out and blossom in February a couple of years. Wow. Okay. So uh, I mean, think, I think that's one good thing about this prolonged, dismal cold um, late winter, early spring is that the trees have not been fooled. So if we do get a heavy wet snow, yeah. at least the leaves won't take more of the burden than they otherwise would have. Look at that. Thirteen at Green Bay. That's a ten to one ratio. 18, okay, 18 to the south of Sturgeon Bay. That's amazing. Amazing. One inch here. Yeah, you're right, Greg. Right. It's clear. We're right on the border. There's going to be places not far from here that get shovelable snow. No question. If this verifies. Wow. Unbelievable. What are your thoughts about flying out at this hour? Oh, on Sunday, I was thinking that's what I'm doing. Well, I think, I think you'll be fine. I think, you know, we should be ready for four or five, six inch snowfalls before the airport really gets uh, problematic here in Madison. I don't know if that shifts just because the season's moving toward April, maybe it does, but I would think that they have the resources to mount the effort necessary to keep the airport in pretty well, good Where are we flying to? We're flying to Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Well, Atlanta's yeah. gonna be in a, in a squall line, or you'll squall, yeah, you'll hopefully by the time we get to the squall line passes. Right, yeah. You'll but then it's over Jacksonville when we get there. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, you guys will be chasing bad weather as various kind, bouncing along on top of these updrafts that are, you know, tens of meters per second yeah. and freely convective. Um, yeah, so I, I think you'll get out, but where you go, I, I think, might be a question. Yeah. I'm just thinking that once you get to Jacksonville, it'll be so wonderful that you're down there. You don't have to worry about all this miserable weather up here. How do we get there without too much trouble? So, uh, that's all I have for today. Pete, thank you for driving. If anybody's got any other comments or things they want to say, I'm happy to. I, I, I'll away. just point out that on the stuff that's hitting us in the next day or so, our model is showing a lot of it's convective. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And uh, we've seen these kind of situations before where we're, we've are we got the cold air over us and we have the elevated convection, mm -hmm. which is what we have. And we've had more uh, propensity for some pretty decent hail under those circumstances. Oh, yeah. It doesn't know. Yeah, Pete, let's go back to tropical and do a cross section of the warm front. And like, uh, we'll find a time in the forecast uh, 24 hours ahead, maybe, or something. And then let's go to 850 temperature if we can. Still trying to figure out how to do this. Maybe it's in forward dynamics. Um, yeah, temperature. Yeah, temperature reduction. Okay, that's front of Genesis right in there. So that's good enough. And let's draw a cross section just north and south from up there. Yeah down to, you know, northern Mississippi. Let's see what that looks like. And let's see. We want, um, it'll give you enough variables. Oh, well, PV will have theta. It won't have theta E. I'd like to see theta E. So let's try that. We're looking looking past the PV. So we're looking at just the theta. I wish there were theta E, because there's the front. There's the one front. It's mm -hmm. fairly intense. The stability is very high, as you point out, Greg. So it'll be cold underneath, but right about here where we are. but. And then the front of Genesis is in the purple, I think, right? Um, What's that yellow? Oh, it's the window on the page. Sorry, sorry. The yellow is the PV. And there's two PV right there, so there's a lot of convective activity going on just above that um, and generating some PV yeah. underneath right along the frontal zone. So I wish we had theta E. We could get an idea what the stratification was really like. But you do get a sense of shear. The shear is intense. There's a 40 meter per second jet or not jet coming out of the page. And on top of it, there's a strong jet going into the page right in the frontal zone. So it's a really nice warm frontal zone. Um, but wrong variable, these guys. It's tropical, too. Why don't they do theta E? I couldn't find it when I looked around the wall. Well, maybe they put them on there without describing it. Hey, theta E. All right, I take it back. I take it back. So here's our front. Beautiful theta E front. Poorly stratified. This is actually new job, convectively unstable, and there's your big updraft. 
right where it's convectively unstable at the front end of the front. So, so where are we on that? Uh, let's see, we're at 44, right? We're about right there. So it's just to our south. Uh, actually, we're between these two. But, but there's even some over us, maybe a little more elevated. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But it depends. I mean, that's hard to predict exactly where that is. That's right. And everywhere where the theta E lines get vertical, there's another up there. So it gives you the impression that there's a whole train of, of them that's going to develop as you kind of change the stratification. Yeah, so that's interesting. It'll be interesting. Cody on the uh, oh, webcast fine. asks, what's the typical penetration of an upper level front into the lower troposphere? I'd say 700 millimoles is, is um, noteworthy, but not extreme. Uh, anything below 700 is, is uh, more than noteworthy. And something that gets to about 600 might be the average. So this one's pretty good right now. This one's a pretty good one. And then that shear zone, I've never seen it before. So it's pretty intense. It's probably so, more intense than that if you use a higher resolution. Uh, probably, power. yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. Really intense. So intense, there's almost no verge here. It's, all, it's almost all on off. Okay, thanks again, Pete, for driving. Yeah, and man. thanks, everybody, for coming and, and for your comments. And, uh, joining online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't thanks forget, for Monday you. afternoon at 3.30, we're going to be streaming Jason Salmonas. Colloquium talk. Yeah, that'll be good. So look on the same, however you found this broadcast, look there on Monday afternoon, 3.30 Central Time, which would be what, 20.30 UPC? Yeah. All right, have a good weekend, everybody. What are your thoughts on the new